Oh, I keep muting it for some reason. Welcome to Sunday evening worship. I pray that y'all had a good relaxing afternoon. I did not as we had like 30 kids in my house. So, um, and Delaney wanted to run all of them. So it was a lot of fun. But no, it's it's been good to have all those kids in the house and tonight three of them go home. So we'll get back to a manageable they already outnumber us, my own kids. And then you add these other kids for my kids' party, and we're totally outnumbered. So at one point, I put some sandbags around our bedroom door, and that was we were holding the line right there. And we're going to come past that. They can stay out there and fight. So, uh, But welcome to Sunday evening worship. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it's so sweet to have you, God, to, to know that you are there in our times of need, God, that you know that when we want to quit, when we want to give up, that we can rely on your strength. And so, God, tonight, I just pray that you be with us. God, be with those that couldn't be here. Be with those that are sick. God, help us to worship you tonight in truth and in spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing 502, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, 502. And I got my inner Chris Moore while you guys are getting there. You like it? Who, who's, who looks better in this, though? Hopefully, you better say me. Me and Chris Moore. What do you think? Oh, great. That's all right, Melba. All right, everybody ready? Make sure I turn it back on. It's on. I ain't worried about it. All right. <clears throat> Got a few announcements. I left it up here because I, no, I didn't leave it up here. I guess I threw it away because I put my gum on it. If you all didn't notice during the sermon, I forgot I had gum in my mouth. So when I bent down, I was putting it on a piece of paper that was in the podium. And that's when I stood back up. Uh, no shame here. But uh, <clears throat> just a few announcements that we have. There's still two point set is available. Um, $12 a piece. Man, this has got to go. I was trying to be like Chris Moore today. I am sweating so bad. Charlie, you got this place like a sauna or whatever Deacon turned that thing on. 
Whew. All right. Now we're ready. We have two point setters available, $12 a piece for anyone that would like to buy some. And then in December, we have, uh, actually, before we get to December, next Sunday, uh, Charlie will be managing the service, but we will have, uh, what's her name? Beth Greer. I can't remember her name for nothing. We'll have Beth Greer here for the whole service, and we'll be taking up a love offering for her. And then Sunday night, um, Tommy will uh, lead worship, uh, and that'll be next week as Felicia and I will be in Florida enjoying Universal Studios Sands Kids. So that's going to be fun. And then, uh, so there's no Wednesday evening worship because it's Thanksgiving, but what I'm going to do is I'll put something on the internet. I'll sit there and stare at my big old head and talk into the uh, iPad or whatever I'm going to record on, but... We'll have something on there for you to click on, and if you want to hear me talk more, you, it'll be on there for you to listen. I know David can't wait. <clears throat> so uh, that's it for this month, I believe. So December, we have on the 19th, we're going to have the play, the kids' Christmas play in here uh, that morning, and then that night will be Happy Birthday Jesus. Then on December 22nd, everyone is invited down to have soup and cornbread in the fellowship hall on behalf of the Awanas kids and the Awana program. So hopefully you all will stay December 22nd. And then December 29th, there's going to be a lock-in, third grade and up. I will be nowhere near this building. I don't know who's going to be in charge that night. Might be the uh, the prisoners running the, the jail, whatever, but uh, you ain't going to find me here that night. And I believe, and then Dicey Gibbons, you have your Christmas party on the 14th of December at 5.30 at Becky's. And make sure you let uh, Miss Mary or the one back there, Melba, uh, know if you can make it so they can get a head count for food. So ladies, that's for ladies only. Don't be getting excited, Thomas. We're not invited. Yeah, I know. We get left out, man. So uh, looking forward to that. And then we have uh, men's is actually going to be December Seventh. No, we're not doing one in December. That's right. There's no men's. Never mind. See, I was trying to keep up. When I keep up, we ain't got nothing. So uh, any other announcements that I'm forgetting? A oh, week of prayer. And it's 4,000 again, I think I saw. Uh, so Lottie Moon is going to be 4,000. It's going to be December 28th, or I mean November 28th to December 5th. And then that Wednesday night in between, we'll do the week of prayer, hopefully, if she can get everything. Brad. And that's this Tuesday? Okay. 7 p.m. at Elam Bible Church. Yeah, the little white church across the street from the big big brick church. Yeah. Hey, you're looking pretty tan. Yeah. I thought, Don, I thought we had an agreement. The next time you went on one of those trips, you're going to throw me in a suitcase. Yeah, I'm sitting here looking at Facebook, and I'm jealous. I need a tan. Charlie said I was pale this morning. Yeah, I need a stinking... Obviously, I need a vacation somewhere where there's some sun. So, any other announcements? All right. So, this evening, I'd like to talk to us about don't quit now. We are facing a time like the United States itself has not faced since probably the Spanish flu. Um, you know, we're facing just some difficulties, whether it's in... Uh, you know, home life, being quarantined together, then we had to change a whole lot of things, right? And we know that personally we don't like change, but you get a bunch of church folk in a building together, they definitely don't like change. I mean, that's why you have churches that split over the color of carpet, right? They don't want to change. But there's been so much change, there's been so much turmoil that we have found ourselves ready to quit. I know I can't be the only one that has sat in my office or sat at home after the kids go to bed during some quiet time and be like, God, what am I doing? Why do you have me doing it? Why did you call me now? You know, the whole time I have been in the pastorate, the whole time God has called me here, we have essentially been under COVID. 
So I don't even know what it's like to pastor a church with, with the fear, without a fear of COVID, without a fear, and I say fear, I use that term loosely, but it's always on our mind, right? It's always on our mind. I was looking at Facebook today, and I saw a friend of mine, and they went home on vacation. They're both in the military, dual military couple. They got a couple of kids, and she put on her post, she goes, I'm sorry we didn't tell everybody, but until we can get our kids uh, vaccinated, we got to keep them safe. I mean, so it's always in the forefront of our mind, I would say. That seems to be the topic of conversation. Or if you want to take it off COVID, go to politics, which normally COVID takes you to politics, but that's neither here nor there. But why and what does God have us here for? Because we're frustrated. Some of us are stressed out. Some of us may be even thinking about quitting, and I, it's not me. But I mean, what are we doing? See, we know we're supposed to draw our strength from God, right? We, we know that. That's why uh, Philippians 4.13, we could say that over and over. And we know there's Bible verses about where our strength comes from. It's not from us, it's from God. And so this evening, I want us to turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, and we're just going to read one verse, verse 20. Luke 5 and verse 20. See, where we find ourselves is Jesus had just called the first disciples, then he cleanses a leper, then he heals a paralytic. And so that's where we find ourselves. He uh, heals somebody who's paralyzed, and I believe I've talked about it on Sunday night. It's the gentleman that wouldn't give up. They wanted Jesus to see their friend. They put him on a mat, carried him around. Jesus ended up into a house, so they climbed on the roof, removed a tile, lowered him down. Well, this is where we find ourselves in Luke chapter 5 and verse 20. And it says, and when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sins are forgiven you. See, what this verse tells us is that present circumstances can be overcome. Present circumstances can be overcome. There is nothing that is outside of God's realm. We believe in a sovereign God. Everything that's happening is happening for a reason. It doesn't always mean it makes us feel any better, right? Especially when we're in the middle of it. But present circumstances can be overcome. And see, it's very important because I want us to focus on that word there. But getting right with God is more important than your current circumstances. See, a lot of us, to include myself, we wouldn't be dealing with some of the things we're dealing with if we were right with God. If we were right with God. We would have that strength. We wouldn't have those doubts, maybe as much. Um, we, we getting right with God is more important than your current circumstances. And that's where God, or that's where Jesus found himself in this situation. If you look at the word there, right? He didn't say your faith, the paralyzed man. He didn't say that. It was because of his friend's faith that the man was healed. But he was not only healed. He was not only healed. It says, man, your sins are forgiven. So see, Jesus saw so deep, he saw so deep into the, the individuals that he didn't just see a paralyzed individual. He saw a bunch of people that needed forgiveness of their sins. He saw a whole bunch of people that needed forgiveness of their sins. And so th- we can overcome these present circumstances, but we have to be right with God. We have to be right with God. And if we're not right with God, if we're leaning on our own understanding, if we're not drawing from God's strength and we're drawing our own, we're going to fail. We're going to fail miserably. Uh, th- this last week, some of you, pr- well, m- most of you probably know if you tried to come, if you came Wednesday night and I wasn't here, I got, I was feeling ill. And so I went to the urgent care on Wednesday after my wife wouldn't quit bother me about it. Well, I was dehydrated is one of the things they said. And then there was something up on my shoulder, but it come down to being dehydrated, according to them. Why is that? I ain't drinking enough water. Thank you, Freddie. See, that's why I asked you. But I was relying on my own strength to do things. I was just constantly going, whether it was for family, whether it was for the church, uh, homecoming coming up. It didn't matter, but Ryan was going to do it. And instead, what I should have done is been on my knees saying, God, what should I do and how should I do it? God, am I spinning my tires for nothing? Or is this the direction I'm supposed to go? And see, and this is what happens. And oh, by the way, 
Jay's dehydrated today. So you can tell him, uh, well, I, I called him a few names. But so Jay uh, is, is good to go. He's dehydrated as well. He just wanted to be like me. So then the second part is in this, there are friends who are willing to help you. There are friends who are willing to help you. Now, what I will tell you is if your friends will sit there in misery with you and commiserate, that's not the friends we're talking about. What kind of friends did this paralyzed individual have? His friends were, had a strong faith. Jesus saw how strong their faith was. See, we need to have that strong faith not only for ourselves, but for our friends. See, the persistence of his friends showed God they had a strong faith. What this tells us is that our faith affects others. Our faith affects others. Some of you have already seen that. Some of you have already been a part of that. You feel the need to pray for somebody. Somebody's been on your mind, and then all of a sudden you get a phone call and something's happened, but they're okay. And it could have been a bad situation. But our faith affects others others and believe it or not our faith affects the sinners or sinners we're all sinners the lost i'll get that right the, our faith affects the lost see when we're down we need to be praying when we're ready to quit we need to be in our bible we need to make sure we're living right we're living that example and we're sharing the gospel and we're sharing the gospel that's our faith we have to have faith to share the gospel right because that's I, I, I don't know about you but I could stand up and talk to a group of people all day long, but to walk up to somebody in the store and talk to them about their faith, that's hard. I don't know why. You'd think that'd be easier. It's one-on-one. -on -one. What's the worst thing they'll tell you? No. But that rejection, there's a fear of that rejection. But our faith affects others, whether it's other Christians, whether it's your spouse, whether it's your children, whether it's each other whether it's your neighbor, maybe somebody that you know that is lost and doesn't know Jesus, your faith is going to affect them. There's a man on, uh, uh, he does a podcast called uh, Preacher Boys Podcast, Eric Skwarzynski. This young man uh, decided to denounce his faith. He is no longer a Christian, no longer believes in God. He was raised in church, was going to be a preacher, and then he started dealing with abuse in that church setting, and it kind of, he just got off the rails and decided that there was no God because of things he had seen. Well, he put a post today on Twitter and said what made his decision, uh, what made him realize his decision was the right one was by the actions of so-called preachers. The ones that called him and berated him, the ones that emailed him, maybe the ones that put Facebook posts about him. But see, how they presented their faith affected him, right? So instead of loving him and trying to guide him back to the fold, they want to preach at him or they want to push him away or they want to treat him like crap. So our faith affects others. See, and God is waiting for you to come to him. See, we, we view salvation as something you come to the altar and it happens. But understand in the Bible, being saved is past, present, and future. Everybody understands that, right? Being saved is past, present, future and future see in revelations uh 320 it says behold i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door i will come into him and eat with him and he with me god's waiting he's knocking on the door are we going to answer it we answered it through salvation right we answered said hey god we want this gift of salvation jesus we want this gift of salvation come in to our lives clear us out forgive us of our sins we're low we're lowly we're worthless without you He's waiting. But it doesn't mean that he's just waiting for us to be saved as in from eternal damnation. He wants us to be saved from our sins. Understand what I'm saying here. What happens when you get into a spiral of your sin, whatever it is? We all have a main sin, if we, you will, something you continually find yourself falling into. What happens? You start getting down on yourself. You start getting depressed, right? You're not presenting fruit of the Spirit, any of the nine expressions, because you can't barely stand to look at yourself in the mirror. I know that's what happens to me when I fall into my sin. Like when I get really angry at somebody and I holler at them, or I say a word I'm not supposed to, I feel really down because I should be able to control that. I should be able to handle that. 
But God wants to save us from that. I mean, he broke the chains of sin. He broke the, 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 the sting of death. He's standing at the door knocking, not just for our salvation, but to have a relationship with us each and every day. Each and every day. He doesn't quit knocking once you're saved. He's always trying to get your attention somehow. Jesus wants to have that relationship with us. And then in Acts 2, 21, it says, and everyone who calls the name of the Lord will be saved. Now we know what that means, right? Anybody that wants to know Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has moved in their life, if they respond to that call, they will be saved. Everyone. Everyone. So listen, so, so understand this. So it talks about salvation, but then there's another part to that, right? How many times did David call on the name of the Lord? You have a whole book about it. Psalms. Now I know David didn't write every one, but you have a whole book about it. David needed to call on the name of the Lord multiple times throughout his life for salvation, to be saved from his enemies, to be saved from his sin. And there's something neat I learned, uh, and some of you probably already know this, but uh, did you know that during David's time, it was well known that the time that uh, Bathsheba was out there uh, taking her bath on the roof, that was normal in that time. That was like the women's time. So David knew that if he went up on that roof, he could see naked women. It wasn't David just happened to be up there walking around. During that time, the custom was the women had that time to take baths on the roof so that way the men would not be up on the roofs looking. So David was looking. David knew exactly what he was doing. But anyway, David called on God to be saved multiple times. It doesn't mean we're weak. It means we're strong. David, regardless of everything he did, he was a horrible parent, but he's a man after God's own heart to this day. You read the scripture, he's a man after God's own heart. So it's easy to lose hope. It's easy to lose heart. And sometimes it does feel like we're swimming upstream. It does, especially for a Christian, right? Because it seems like no matter what we do, the devil is always there to throw up a roadblock. The devil is always there to tell us how worthless we are the devil's always there to say that'll never work the devil's always there to say well you know that sounds good but hey what about this shiny object but no matter what everything happens everything that happens is the uh, god's will and if you read your bible i think it's important that we understand that sometimes god wills his people wander the wilderness for 40 years because of their lack of faith that was God's will. In Ezekiel, it was God's will that the temple was going to be destroyed and that they were going to be destroyed and they were going to be sent all over and eventually all the remnant of Israel would end up in Babylon. And then once he was done destroying everything or having the, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, destroy everything, then when his wrath was all played out, then he was going to start working to rebuild what he promised Abraham. But God, because of their lack of faith, because of their lack of understanding what God was wanting from them, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. I don't know about you, but I would hope that God did not call me to be a preacher, and God did not call me to be a preacher here at First Baptist Church of Turbyville to wander the desert for 40 years. I would hope that God brought me here so that we could work towards making disciples, we could work towards telling the lost about Jesus Christ. But we do know that if it's God's will, we will wander the desert for 40 years. But here's what I do know. I do know that God wants us to remain faithful to the end. And there's no better scripture than Hebrews 3, uh, chapter 3, 14 through 19. And the author of Hebrews wrote, For we have come... To share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end, as it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, are, for who were the, those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? 
but to those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. So I want us to think just for a second. What was it like when you first got saved? What was it like when you first got saved? You couldn't wait to tell people. You were excited about being a part of a body. You were excited about the hope that was in Jesus Christ. Because I don't know what brought most of you or probably all of you to salvation. But I want us to think about that. See, we're supposed to have that same zeal to the end. To the end. But it is easy to get comfortable. It is easy to just sit back on our laurels and say, well, we've done this much. We're good. We don't need to do anything else. But we need to remain faithful to the end. So what God is telling us through the scripture, not through me, what God is telling us is don't quit now. If you feel like quitting, don't quit now. The best is yet to come. Regardless of what happens, God's will is going to be done here and elsewhere. God's will is going to be done. The best is yet to come. The worst thing that can happen is you end up dead or the rapture and you're in heaven. The best is yet to come. Don't quit now. See, now is the time to answer the call. Now is the time to be about the kingdom. We need to quit worrying about trivial earthly issues and focus on what God, had, uh, God called us or commanded us to do. As our church's mission statement says, connecting people with Jesus Christ. This should begin now, but I hope that it is what we will focus on in the coming year. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful evening, God. Just thank you for your word. God, help those of us that are just feeling beaten down. God, help us to lean onto your strength, lean onto your understanding. There's so many that are weak and weary from the fight, from just dealing with day-to-day things. God, I pray that you give them the strength that they need. God, there's people that mentally are just exhausted, that just don't know what to do, lay awake at night with all these problems. God, I pray that you give them the peace that surpasses all understanding. So God, as we sit here tonight and we hear from you through your word, God, help each and every one of us to remain faithful to the end. God, help us to not quit now because there's never been a time like today where the world needs Christ and help us to be that beacon, shining light for you. And we just praise you and thank you for everything that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We got tons of prayer requests. And I'll read them off tonight. Um, Felicia's sister or cousin in law, Alicia Campiglia. I don't know if she's out of the hospital yet, but she went back in for more surgeries. Um, And pray for uh, her cousin because they think he may be back on drugs. Because after the accident, went back, you know, he went on painkillers because of the stuff that happened. And so. Something's not right there. Just pray for the Campiglia family. Uh, Continue to pray for Bryson and Jaden Cato. Uh, Those are uh, Kendall's cousins that were involved in that fire that blew up in Sumter. Um, Continue to pray for Leela and family as they're dealing with her being at home and uh, just going to try and make it as peaceful as possible. Um, So she may be reaching out to some of you for some help during this time. So just be uh, ready and available. Uh, Continue to pray for Margie. She's in Sumter at Encompass. Does anybody know? I think that's the name. I think that's what Anna told me. But uh, Anna got to go and sat outside the window and talked to her. Uh, So they're hoping what this this rehab facility is hoping to do. Because if you remember, prior to her getting COVID, she was able to walk and move around with that walker. Well, when she got out of the hospital, 12 days of not getting out of the bed, but one time, she couldn't do anything. She couldn't sit up. She couldn't stand up. She couldn't walk without somebody helping her. So the hope and prayer is that this place can get her back to at least where she was pre-COVID, moving around again. So pray for that. Uh, Continue to pray for uh, Betty Coker and Jakey Creech. We have uh, Miss Bessie May, our homebound Ann Gibbons, Evelyn Gibbons, Marcel Page, and Jay Parker. And then continue to remember Cecilia Beasley, Jack Boykin, uh, Mr. Bruce, Sandra... uh, Dennis, 
Travis Floyd, Joel Hartley, Bill Wallace, Nancy Morris. Is there any update? I mean, I know it's Sunday, but no. Uh, with the hip, and then continue to pray for Jay. Uh, it, like I said, he had um, he was uh, dehydrated. But you know it's bad if Jay goes to the hospital. I think everybody here can agree to that. It takes a lot to get that stubborn man to the hospital. So he went today. All right, are there any other prayer requests besides these? No? All right, so we're going to do something a little bit different tonight. We're going to get up and we're all going to pray over these Operation Christmas Child boxes. They're going to be delivered tomorrow. Our church did 73 of them. Is uh, Maranatha's in here too? Yeah. So Hal also delivered his here for me to take to Sumter. So Maranatha's uh, Methodist Church is in there. But uh, what I'd like to do is get us all to come over here and pray. Anybody that feels so led to pray can pray. Mother Mary, will you close us out in prayer? Huh? All right. So if everybody will get up and let's pray over these boxes. All right, let's pray. Father God, just thank you so much for this opportunity to bless those that need it most, God, in other countries. Thank you for this program. Thank you for Mary and her heart for this program. God, I pray that, pray that the boxes that touches the kids, God, that these kids touch, will bring them to know you, will meet their needs. God, because this is so much, this is about so much more than just what's in these boxes. It's about you. So God, help these boxes get there safely and just be with those kids.
Amen. All right. Seventy-three, and then how many did Maranatha have? Oh, with there. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about how much did they bring. Seven. So 80 is what we'll deliver. All right, I got to go turn this thing off so people will quit. I backed my Jeep up over here so we can walk them out. <laughs> 